Hi. In this video, I'd like to talk about vascular health, specifically the arteries. We've all heard of the idea of plaque forming in arteries. What you may not realize is it's actually forming in the wall of the artery. It's not like a mineral accumulation in a pipe or it's directly contacting the, the water that's going by. Why does this happen? Well, it doesn't happen to all animals. It happens to a few animals. Of the 4,000 mammals that we know of, four of them, humans, some monkeys, fruit bats, and guinea pigs, don't make vitamin C. We've lost the gene that makes it. It's called glulonolactone oxidase. And in these four animals, humans and others, uh, it's called a pseudogene. The gene is there, it's not complete, it doesn't work right. And heart disease shows up in these kinds of animals because if you make enough vitamin C, you can repair the arteries. But it's not enough just to take vitamin C. Um, even if you were taking it from the day you were born, there's a lot of things that happen in our environment that predispose us to heart disease. So let's talk about how this process takes place. As I said, it starts off with the pseudogene. There's actually a few pseudogenes in humans. Uh, one is uh, urate oxidase. We have lost the ability to properly get rid of uric acid, so we're prone to gout. One is phytolysase, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, that's the gene that repairs DNA damage from ultraviolet light, which is why we're susceptible to skin cancer. And then the uh, vitamin C gene, which makes us susceptible to heart disease. Now, to compensate for this, our red blood cells have changed uh, a little bit, and they recycle an enormous amount of vitamin C. We are spectacular at recycling vitamin C. So we only need a little bit, and then we can recycle it. Uh, but there are some other things going on, as I mentioned. It's not just this vitamin C pseudogene. So let's talk about how this process occurs and how we might back our way out of it towards better health. Now, if you look at where plaque forms, and by definition, plaque is when the arterial wall is greater than 1.5 millimeters, it's an arbitrary value. Uh, I think any time the arterial wall is, is growing, that's plaque. But medical establishment says, OK, we need to pick a number, 1.5. When, uh, when you look at the arterial wall at where plaque forms, it's not equally uh, deposited across the body. It shows up in very specific places. It shows up at places where the arteries bend or where they branch. And the reason for this is because these are places where the blood flow becomes turbulent. It can swirl around, creates little eddies. Instead of all going forward, it can actually come around backward and, and make a little whirlpool. And it abrades the artery. Now, in a healthy body, the blood is not coagulating. We need the ability to coagulate so that if we are injured, we don't bleed out. But we want our blood to be thin enough to move without abrading the arterial system. And in most of us, that's not the case. Most of us have blood that's a little too thick, a little too sticky. This can be from stress, infection, inflammation, and the water you drink. The way in which uh, the water utilities treat water to filter it is they add an aluminum, which creates a positive charge to make all of the bits of dirt and debris that's floating in the water stick together so it's easier to filter out. But inevitably, some of that aluminum and positive flocculating charge gets in our bloodstream, and it makes our blood, which has lots of little things floating in it, stick together. Basically, tap water causes blood to get a little coagulated. Uh, it does this because it is decreasing the negative charge on the blood that's required for all the bits in the blood to repel one another. That's called zeta potential. Now, a healthy zeta potential not only keeps the blood um, thin and moving easily, 
but it also uh, imparts a negative charge to the albumin on the arterial wall so that it can actually uh, repel the blood constituents. So the little bits in the blood it kind of bounce off the arterial wall. It's almost like an electrical nonstick coating. And what happens is when people start getting their blood uh, too coagulated, when the zeta potential goes, when it starts to go towards the process of coagulation, well, it's turning into a scab and that causes the blood to crystallize slightly. You get these little spicules of fibrin and the, the platelets stick together and it becomes more of um, an abrasive fluid. So what ends up happening is this now uh, kind of abrasive fluid, the blood, is now uh, moving and circling, circling in these turbulent zones. It's actually sandblasting uh, certain spots in our arterial wall. And again, without the vitamin C to go in there and help do the repair work, as well as it could if we made our own, uh, the arteries start to have problems. Uh, now, what the body does to respond to this is to put LDL cholesterol into that weak area. And LDL cholesterol does a number of amazing things. It uh, brings in smooth muscle cells from the adventita into the media to kind of bolster and reinforce the area that's being damaged. It uh, has a growth stimulating effect and a, and a wound repairing effect, so it helps repair the tissue. And it also stabilizes the fibrous cap, which is where the plaque is closest to the bloodstream. It's, you know, it's just one or two cells thick, because if that were to rupture, uh, the inside of the plaque, the foam cells and the other parts, the inflammatory aspects could get in and into the bloodstream and cause an emboli. So LDL isn't the enemy. Uh, and although we want LDL below 100, we want it that way naturally. If we force it below 100, the drugs, then the artery never gets properly repaired and the plaque can rupture. So LDL is important, but as a marker, like uh, the, water, the oil light on your truck. You don't just bang it with a hammer. You have to go and, and fix the oil, right? The light's not the problem. The LDL's not the problem. The issue is that as the LDL does what it's doing, it causes the arterial wall to thicken, and it can make the blood flow um, more and more problematic as that lumen, as that artery gets thinner and thinner from the growth of the plaque, less and less blood can get through, and that can cause what uh, cause the problems. This isn't the end of the world because the body has a failsafe for this. It will start taking nearby capillaries and grow new blood vessels as a bypass. You've heard of bypass operations. The body does this for us. It'll bypass and create basically arteries out of capillaries. Now, you've heard of people walking around with a 95% or 100% blocked coronary artery. Why are they not dead? It's this collateral growth, right? Then you've heard of people who have a 30% blocked artery and keel over. Well, they had no collateral growth. So even a little bit of uh, a 30, 40% drop of blood to the heart in the absence of collateralization is lethal or can be, yeah? All right. Uh, there's one thing, uh, one more aspect that happens I want to talk about, and that is the calcification of the arterial system. And that can be a global phenomenon, but also tends to show up in certain places more than others. Now, the heart itself, from an engineering standpoint, is not large enough to pump all the blood. There are other systems that pump our blood. Our muscles, um, most notably uh, our calf muscles, pump the venous blood back. Our diaphragm, with every breath, assuming we're breathing deeply, creates positive and negative gradients in our thorax, in our chest, and that sucks the blood in and helps push it out from the venous blood, which is why breathing is an important part of the whole circulation system. And finally, I believe that the arteries themselves have a pulse uh, peristalsis, if you would, and that as the pulse of blood goes through the artery, 
and stretches it just a little bit, the artery responds by squeezing, and what that does is create a, a peristalsis where it helps push the blood. Can't do it as well if the artery is calcified. You may have heard of uh, arterial stiffness or pulse wave velocity. These are measurements of how flexible the artery is. So we want our arteries to be flexible and not calcified so that they can help the heart do its job. We don't want the heart doing all of the work. Okay, so there's two flaws in the model of, that lead or can lead to uh, vascular problems. Uh, the first is what happens if the collateralization process doesn't happen? Well, why wouldn't it? Well, metals like mercury and lead can interfere with new blood vessel growth, and so can chemicals. And if new blood vessels are not growing, then if an artery gets blocked, there's no natural bypass for it. That's the most dangerous situation. Now, take a look at the graph of heart attacks in the United States in the last century. You'll see that they're stable up into the 30s, then it starts to increase peaking in the 60s, and then it's been coming down ever since. What matches that? The chart for cigarette smoking. People started smoking much more commonly in the 30s, peaked in the 60s, been coming down ever since. Now we know that cigarettes are associated with heart disease, but why? It's because nicotine can dysregulate and damage the ability of the body to create new blood vessels new collateralization. So chemicals like found in cigarettes and metals have to be removed from the body so that the new blood vessels, the natural bypass, can take place. The second flaw in the model is the fibrous cap. Uh, if we are uh, taking drugs to lower LDL, then what's going to reinforce that fibrous cap? It might only be one or two uh, cells thick, and if it bursts and all the inflammatory things come out, that's an emboli. So that's the other flaw in the model. We have to make sure that for the plaque that's there, it's stabilized. Okay, what do we do about this? What are some options? So we mentioned the low level of vitamin C because of our vitamin C pseudogene. That's easy. Take 500 milligrams of vitamin C. Clearly, if someone is under stress uh, or sick, they might want more. But it doesn't take much if your recycling system is operational uh, to keep the body in decent shape. How about the zeta potential? Now remember, that's the negative charge on the arterial lining and the negative charge in the blood itself that keeps everything moving and keeps it from becoming abrasive. Well, if we want to put a negative charge in, I love potassium citrate. It's got a negative three charge. That's a pretty strong negative charge and will increase the data potential. If you want something stronger, EDTA has a negative four charge. But for daily use, negative three is plenty good. So that will deal with the coagulation and the loss of electrical repulsion in the arterial wall. How about helping the artery actually repair itself? Well, chondroitin sulfate is fantastic for that. It's got a lot of the raw materials required for the artery to help do its repair work. And this is going to be important if we want to lower LDL. Now, one natural way that you can work with LDL was discovered by Linus Pauling, the only person to win two unshared Nobel Prizes, and the doctor he was working with, uh, a student at the time, Matthias Rath, where they di discovered that lysine would block the effects of LDL in the arteries. Now this is because the arterial wall is made up partially of lysine, and when it frays, when it's damaged, the lysine residue, the lysine, uh, and, uh, a piece of lysine sticks out of it, is, is like a, a frayed piece of fabric. That thread is the lysine, and it, that is what the LDL attaches to. But if you take extra lysine in your diet, then any LDL that's in your bloodstream will attach to that. But remember, if you're going to do that, you have to do 
all the other things that the LDL was going to do for you. You have to strengthen the arterial wall. You have to deal with a fibrous cap. In terms of the fibrous cap, I'm a big fan of GoTo Cola. It's a herb that has shown the ability to stabilize the caps on, uh, on the fibrous caps on the arterial plaque. There are other things you might consider as well. Uh, arginine is really important for nitric oxide production, but not everybody has a fully functioning arginine nitrous oxide production system. They might be better taking citrulline. So in addition to doing detox, to get the metals and the chemicals out for vascularization. And we've discussed detox in other videos. I'm a fan of Xenoplex and metacardium. I would pose that it would be a good idea to take something that has all of these things in it, a vitamin C, the potassium citrate, the go-to cola, the chondroitin sulfate, the arginine, the citrulline, so forth and so on. For those of you that are interested in these ingredients, we're going to make a product called Rubiplex that has all them in there in the amounts that I think are intelligent. And it's something that I take five days a week. I don't think you take anything every day of the week because your body always should have a chance to uh, take a break from it. But five days a week, I'll be taking it the rest of my life. Now, if someone's got uh, a lot of calcification, they might want to consider adding uh, a lot more K2 to their diet. Uh, the Rubiplex product has uh, natokinase and vitamin K2, but sometimes someone might want a very heroic dose. Just keep in mind though, vitamin K2, while it has been associated with uh, work, uh, supporting the body and dealing with calcifications in the arteries also causes the blood to clot. So if you're going to do vitamin K2 in high amounts, you want to be checking either your prothrombin time or do something where you can make sure you're not clotting too much. And if that's happening, you might want to mm, deal with that with some, uh, you know, you could take some, um, uh, well, potassium citrate would actually uh, be something you could do for that. But you might want to have something balance out the coagulating aspects of high doses of uh, K2. As always, if you have any questions, drop us a line.